Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Chennai Chess Olympiad 2022. It's round number six, and this round was nuts. As you saw from the thumbnail, there was some crazy drama in the Norway match. We will cover that first very quickly. Uh, as always, if you've enjoyed the content, all courses are 33% off. Use code Olympiad. Oh my goodness, this round was crazy. And for that reason, I've actually added a game. Today we are going to look at 12 games in half an hour. Isn't that impressive? No? Just me? Okay, terrific. We're gonna get started with the match between Australia and Norway. Balanced match, but Norway is the rating favorite on every board. Uh, Anton Smirnov with the white pieces plays e4, and Magnus plays the Nimsovich defense. <laughs> and he doesn't play e4, e5. He turns this into a Peard's defense style position. White plays in a very pragmatic way, uh, and then trades in the middle and uh, creates a totally symmetrical structure. Uh, and then castles queenside. So credit to Smirnov, who is not just kind of castling short. He's going to try to play for this kind of an attack. Magnus obliges very, uh, very, very clearly. And uh, as you can see, I mean, the players really just begin blasting forward at one another. Uh, Smirnov trying to control Magnus's expansion. So Magnus says, OK, well, you can't attack me then. Uh, Smirnov plays bishop d6, looking to chase the rook or the pawn. Gets his king over the, the b file. Uh, and then kicks the queen out and tries to maneuver. Now, right around here, basically moves 15 to 20 is where Magnus demonstrates why he's Magnus, uh, and people demonstrate why they're, you know, only 2,600. Oh, I apologize. We should be watching all these games with an eval bar. Uh, that is the way the, uh, the, the thing is cropped. Um, and, you know, uh, Smirnov here, uh, just as you can see from his kind of... Uh, the, the bishop is on c5, d6, b4, c5. Like, he's not exactly sure what's the next plan of action. The problem is that Magnus is sure, and uh, Smirnov offers up a pawn sacrifice, technically a double pawn sacrifice, to go for a big attack on the king. Very interesting idea, because the bishop cuts the king's escape path. Uh, here, the only move that holds is queen d8, and Magnus finds it. Good defense by Magnus, and for a very, very kind of brief moment in this game, uh, it, it, it seems as though Smirnov's attack is going to break through. Like, it... I don't exactly know how you would prevent, you know, knight at knight here, rook here, knight here, something along these lines. And Smirnov does, in fact, play the move knight f5. The engine here wants him to just go back and take this pawn. Uh, and it claims that the best way to play is to repeat moves. I don't think Magnus would have repeated moves. I'm sure he would have kind of played on. Uh, Smirnov, to his credit, uh, goes as aggressive as possible and sacrifices a piece. So gf5, rook g1 is what he wanted. Uh, Magnus plays the second best uh, way according to Stockfish, which is taking on e4, uh, getting a third pawn, and now there's just tactics kind of flying all over the board. Um, if you take the queen and then take the knight, obviously this knight is hanging, so you've got to be quite careful. We have a lot of tactics here, and Magnus is three pawns up, but white is still trying to attack. The problem is that at some point you get frustrated, you make a slight inaccuracy, and Magnus is going to begin kind of defending himself perfectly. Look at this, king f6, check. A king move check. King f6 check. Uh, Magnus now kicks out the queen. And once you start removing white pieces from the board, uh, you're going to be in good shape. I mean, listen, credit to Smirnov, who showed up to fight. All right? It took 40 moves for Magnus to extinguish white's initiative. Uh, and yeah, I mean, listen, Smirnov came to play. Um, but there was some crazy drama in this match after all. Uh, Bortu lost. So Ariantari lost uh, against uh, the Bortu of Australia. And on board three, we had Bobby Chang, who was taking on um, uh, Yun Ludwig Hammer. Now, this game actually was more or less balanced. It was a Catalan. It was uh, a very close Catalan. Uh, here, Bobby Chang accepted uh, capture on c4 and just very slowly built up his position. Like, he just basically acted like he wasn't down a pawn. Jun Ludwig had a very nice position, uh, and, you know, Bobby uh, went aggressive. G4, G5, trying to fight back against the fact that he's just cleanly down a pawn. And Jun Ludwig I mean, was doing quite well. It just, you know, players are preparing the kings uh, and pre preparing the g-file for a potential battle. Uh, now the peace rotations begin. Knight jumps to f5. The knight gets booted, so it jumps into d6. You get rid of the dark squared bishop, but, I mean, Jun Ludwig is doing a great job, so where is the drama? I don't understand, right? I mean, he's just playing a great game. Uh, it's minus 1.5. He's kept his pawn advantage. He's repelled the white forces. Uh, but okay, he loses a pawn. Fine, he's losing a pawn. 
but he gets this. The bishop is coming to c8. Looks like he's actually creating some meaningful play here against the potentially barren king. Uh, position is still very much in the balance, except on move 38, you Ludwig lost on time. He lost on time. It's move 38. I don't know what happened, but obviously he had two minutes. I mean, sorry, he had to make two moves. So he had to play two more moves. He had to make, actually, no, he had to make three moves. He had to make move 38, 39, 40, and then he would get his extra time. I don't exactly know what's going on there, but we've actually seen a good amount of people lose on time in this event, and he loses on time. On board four, Norway was winning. Uh, Johann Sebastian Christensen was, was beating, I, I think it's Justin Tan on board four for Australia, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Is it Justin Tan? Uh, is it Justin Tan? It's Justin Tan. Yes, Kui Bokarov is on board too. Uh, and uh, he, he couldn't win. He drew on board four from a winning situation, and Norway loses to Australia. All right, Mac people were like, Magnus should just simul the entire... Uh, I mean, obviously, it's kind of derogatory to the other players. That's not very nice. But yeah, Team Norway is struggling. I mean, they are really struggling. Uh, now, we are going to move around a little bit for the contenders for first and second place. India 2, India B is playing Norway. Uh, not Norway. Norway's not playing two matches at the same time. Armenia on board one. Uh, Gukesh is playing a 2700 rated player, Gabriel Sargisyan. Gukesh is five out of five. Can he make it six? He plays Queen A4 check. Someone asked this question in the comments yesterday. Why doesn't Queen A4 check win the bishop in the Rogozin? That's because the knight can block. This is a very theoretical position. It's been played many times. And if you take a look at this position, Gukesh makes it very clear with the move G takes F3 that he would like to use the g-file and bulldoze his opponent because he hasn't castled kingside yet, and he will castle this way. So Gukesh is trying to win this game at all costs. Doesn't matter if it's board one of the Olympiad. His team is perfect. The enemy team is perfect. Let's go. Rook g1, knight e4, and Gukesh is just going. I mean, here comes e5. Look at his attack brewing. Rook g5. Oh my goodness. Various ideas of rook h5, rook g1, hitting the bishop with e6. Uh, bishop to a6. Uh, rook g1, g6, now this, and f5. And I mean, Gukesh is just roaring forward. The attack is playing itself. Black plays bishop to a7, getting out of the way. Gukesh shreds open the black position, gets his king to safety, steps off the c-file, and in this position, uncorks an absolutely savage move. Bishop takes b4, oh my goodness. Do you know what the point of this move is? It has nothing to do with the bishop. The bishop is gonna die. The point of that move is after queen takes b4, he triple stacks, and there is no way to prevent the infiltration on g8. The only thing that black can do is try to get a material loss to prevent checkmate. We have a queen trade, but the pawn sneaks in, and rook g8 is still a problem. Why? Because you're gonna lose a rook, but get a queen. Oh my goodness. And Gukesh now just has to pick up a few pawns and the most important pawn that he has to get is this one. Because when you play against the queen with a rook and a bishop or a rook and a knight, you want a pawn imbalance. You want the pass pawn. And that is the pawn that he's going to use to win this game. He's going to safeguard his, uh, his king. He's going to pick up a few more pawns, not allowing his opponent to get counterplay. He's now won three pawns all over the board. And Sargisyan just resigns because he's, uh, he's going to be unable to defend himself. There's not enough pawns and white has a4, a5 on the way. Gukesh is six for six. Are you, are you kidding me? He's 27-20. What? But that's not the end of this match. Because on the bottom boards, it was Samvelter Sahakian and Robert Hofhanesian who were delivering for, in, uh, for, for Armenia. On board four, Ranak Sadwani was defeated. So it comes down to this game. The winner of this game wins the match on board three. We have a Nimso. We have an imbalanced Nimso. Uh, one of these kind of obscure coordinate setups by white where the knight doesn't go to f3 and instead goes to the e2 square and the beast is doing beast things okay he's obviously creating some sort of king side attack potentially on h7 but it was his opponent who did an excellent job in coordinating counterplay and launching a counter attack with d4 a well-timed move that doesn't even look possible but the point is that White's knight on e2 is overloaded and cannot sustain the pressure. And when this happens, White is suddenly really passive. 
There is no checkmate over here. It's not like Black is going to blunder a mate. In fact, Black is going to start immediately creating counterplay. And he gets a wonderful position by winning the pawn on b2. Then he plays bishop a3. And now, uh, Baskaran Adiban with the white pieces has a situation where he's down a pawn. He could defend himself here in a very long endgame. But the players have about a minute each. They are both in severe time trouble. And... Uh, Adiban Baskaran here makes a very bold decision to kind of put the knight on the edge of the board and accept the damage to his structure. He must have thought that this was a sustainable endgame. He must have thought the bishop versus the knight is holdable. But it's not so simple because white's pawn structure is in ruins and suddenly the knight transfers over here. Every king and pawn endgame is lost here for white. So... White has to be super careful and cannot just simply trade. And as his bishop gets booted back, the knight comes into c3 or f2, and that's simply game over. And despite Gukesh being 6 for 6, the bottom boards go in favor of Armenia, and Armenia wins the match and is now 6 for 6 themselves as a team. They are in first place. One of the only teams that can catch them is the United States of America led by Fabiano Caruana against Iran in this match. The other three boards drew. If Iran wins this match, that is a massive upset. If Fabiano writes the ship, he's struggling a little bit in this Olympiad. US is in second place. So this one, a Nidorf Sicilian with a6. Uh, the English attack with f3. Uh, we're going to have a, just a, a vintage... Opposite side castling Sicilian. I mean, Parham's a little bit bigger than Fabiano, but Fabiano's, you know, nimble. He rolls up his sleeves like, let's go, let's scrap, no problem, right? B5, G5, B4, GF, BC, takes, takes. Pawns are flying off the board. B and C file is wide open. A5, A4 is on the way. Rook G1 is on the way as well. And Parham did a nice job in this game. I mean, he, uh, he had a very comfortable position after the first 20 moves. He seemed to be the one that was maybe going to break through first, as G7 is actually not as weak as we thought. Um, and right around here, Fabiano started kind of going backwards. I mean, he sort of... Uh, he, 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 he was playing like... I, they're, they're not exactly right here, but right here, he started playing Queen E1. Like, you notice, there's kind of a threat of a repetition of moves here, Queen H4. Um, you can repeat, but Fabi plays queen e1. Seems like white is beginning a retreating process. Uh, we have knight f4, we have c4, and black can sort of continue battering things over here. Rook b8 potentially, but of course white has a very pleasant position. I mean, good bind here. Black should maybe kind of try to go the opposite way uh, with the queen. Of course, not right away you would lose the queen, but um, Parham now sets the board on fire, and he plays the move f5. That is an extremely risky decision because now you open up potentially an entire side of the board that's going to be weak and Fabiano takes immediately and plays bishop d3. Combining tactical play with positional play, Fabiano constantly threatens a queen trade and, and threatens long-term problems for black on the g-file in the center. And let's not forget that this queen side, if it gets moving for white, is going to be decisive. So... Fabi slowly builds more pressure, and you see the problem. That move f5 gave white an infiltration square on g6. He trades, he takes, and now he is up a pawn. You cannot take this because you would lose the queen, but you don't need to because you have queen d2, and uh, you're just getting in. I mean, Parham with the move f5 got overzealous and ruined his position, and now gets his king hunted out into the middle of the board, and there's just nothing he can do. He sacrifices, tries to get some checks. Fabi's king hides in the middle, and... Uh, we have a sacrifice of a queen for a queen trade, but this endgame is totally winning for Fabiano, who had a nice bind, and the one decision that Parham probably regrets is playing f5. A little bit too much, a little bit too loose, and Fabi made him play pay by playing perfect chess after that. Just honestly, played a perfect game, correctly exchanging, correctly applying pressure, taking advantage of that pawn move, Literally, I mean, at, at that level, it's one pawn move. One pawn move decides the game. It created too many weaknesses and too many problems for Black to deal with. We are going to now jump uh, to the women's side where uh, there have been just amazing games. So uh, the Indian women's team is playing the Georgian team. Uh, they are uh, neck and neck. They are both at the top. Uh, and Hampi Konaru is actually playing 
if I saw this correctly, like between seven and eight months pregnant, which is uh, like incredible. I mean, if I was seven, eight months pregnant, I would just want to chill on, on my couch, I would imagine, right? I mean, it's just, I, I hope she's not getting too stressed. I hope she's getting the rest she needs. That's going to be a chess playing kid for sure. That kid is already getting some, uh, some, some, ch some chess knowledge, uh, if you will. So uh, she's leading her team. She, she's had an okay event thus far. Tanya Sajdev has been the anchor for them on the, on the last board. Uh, Nana Zadnidze plays a Benoni. And white in the Benoni system tries to prevent black from playing b5. Black tries to play b5, f5, or knight h5, rook e8. Those are, or knight e8, right? So um, you'll see in the game that, you know, black is combining several plans, looking for b5, potentially fighting in the middle. Benoni is a super wicked opening. There's the move b5, right? Um, and there's f5. So I promise you b5 and f5, right? This is typical Benoni stuff. Uh, we have a, b, a, b. And from an early standpoint, it looked like Black achieved kind of all of the things that uh, that she wanted from the opening. Uh, Humpy played the move B4, and after C4, Black is actually just better. That's actually the funny thing. Black has a very powerful uh, blockade here and doesn't let White do a whole lot. So White's going to try to use all this and maybe E4, F4. That's kind of the game plan. So if White can successfully get all those things, they're going to be in good shape. We have the Knight going to C6. And I told you a while ago, if white can successfully get the pawns rolling, white will be better. Here comes f4, here comes bishop f3, and after a little bit of preparation, here comes e4. Look how quickly everything changed. So, uh, Zadnidze playing with black, I guess, had to, from this position, had to navigate a little bit better. Uh, like something with knight f3, for example, and maybe focusing on the pawn on d5, not allowing that knight to survive. Because just allowing the f3 knight to survive and get to c6 changed the game once, but then allowing all of this changed the game a second time, and uh, white did not look back. I mean, she just galloped forward, traded the right pieces, and I mean, at the end of the day, you got a pawn two squares away from queening, right? Like, that pawn's just going to be a problem. As Kamaru Usman does after his fights, I'm a problem. That pawn's a problem, and uh, you can trade everything. That pawn's just, it's going to be the deciding factor in this game. Goes to c7, rook back to e3, and one c pawn is not like the other. That pawn is significantly better, and India rides to a victory and is in first place uh, in the, uh, on the, in the Women's Olympiad. But there were some other completely insane matchups. So first of all, Kazakhstan versus Azerbaijan was crazy. Uh, this matchup was, uh, I think, the board four matchup, and it's, it's, it's crazy because the average rating there is like still extremely high. Uh, we have a Queen's Gambit declined with a6. Early on in this game, white, I mean, black played some absurd prep. This is like a crazy opening. I've, I've not seen this before, accepting a damage to the structure, and white was just much better. I mean, white had a huge advantage early on. Uh, the advantage stemmed from the fact that you can actually take on b7, and apparently after rook b8, uh, sorry, uh, after, yeah, 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 after rook b8, you can just take a second pawn. Uh, there's like rook b2. And uh, you just enjoy yourself here. I'm not really sure why white didn't do that. I guess white thought that they were maybe gonna get some counterplay for black. Instead of that, white did this and still had a very good position. Like white was better most of this game. I mean, black's pawn structure is in absolute ruins. There are now threats potentially gonna be firing on all cylinders, right? But black defended for a while. Takes, takes. Bishop d5, white still enjoys a comfortable uh, position, but no longer much of an advantage because actually black is going to attack on the g-file. And how quickly things turned around here were incredible. First of all, knight d3 attacked the rook and targeted this pawn. And in this position, black missed one of the most savage wins I've ever seen in my life. In this position, black can play bishop h3. Now that move makes sense because if queen h3, there's knight f2. But to win after gh3, f5, sacking the queen for a mate. And the queen has no choice. The queen is getting hit. So you got to go here. Bishop h3 and f5 is disgusting. Now, you also don't have to play that. There is g3, but okay, g3, there is rook g4. <laughs> if this, then this. If queen h5, then black, you know, apparently can play b5. Or I mean, it's just, Stockfish is just an absolute scumbag. 
Black doesn't see that and instead plays like this and still continues to apply pressure. Very nice trick here. Can't take because of this. And this game was just an absolute tactical shootout. Like, in this position, white can save the game with bishop takes f7. And if king f7, you get in. But instead of that, white plays knight f3. Check. Here. Queen f1. That's mate. But what if you get out of the way? Knight f2. e5. Counterattack with e f6. Black takes. Queen e7. And now you have queen h3, rook g4, rook g2. And it's the white king that suffers checkmate a move or two before the black king can suffer checkmate. And uh, black wins and Azerbaijan is uh, in second place on the women's side. There was one more matchup between Romania and uh, Ukraine. Ukraine women's team, massive team. Their board four is an IM rated 2400. But in this game, uh, anything could happen. We have another Benoni. We just actually saw this in the game between Zadnidze and uh, Humpy Konaru, but a different way because here... Uh, white takes on a6 and damages black's pawns. Uh, this was a very long game. And throughout this game, white did everything right. There is no b5 for black. There is f5, but f5 became f4 a little bit later, and that's it. I mean, black is just out of play. White now will very slowly expand, take a pawn, take another pawn, and win the game, right? I mean, white is also a nearly 300-point favorite, right? So, well, 230. That's... My math is off, but... Uh, that's not nearly 300, but I mean, it's just a beautiful position here for white. Like, white is just doing a great job. Look at these pawns. These pawns are doubled. These pawns are doubled. These pawns are an island. Black was not giving up anytime soon. All right, black fought back, created kingside counterplay, took back a pawn on d5, traded queens, and got into an endgame where the white king was a little suspicious, right? White is still a pawn up, but there's plenty of play remaining, and the d pawn for white, uh, for black, is still very annoying. No rook trades. No rook trades. I'm going to keep harassing you and trying to win your pawns. Now it's three pawns each. This is an equal position, but it's 2-1. All right, it's 2-1 Ukraine. Let's not forget Ukraine is winning. Black is not giving up. Black is not settling for a draw despite being the rating underdog. Black's trying to create some winning chances. Look at bishop c3. Trying to promote the d-pawn, okay? Now there's pass pawns everywhere. Every side has multitude of pass pawns. Knight h4. All right, king g7. Now white is better again. That's what happens when white is the rating favorite, right? Rook g4, bishop a5, knight e3. Black is trying to get in and attack white. White is trying to get in and attack black. Who, who's going to break? Knight d1. Still looks equal. Black's still trying. Black's still trying. Wins the pawn. And white blunders. In this position, white had to bring the king out this way in a very counterintuitive fashion. And the point is that you're simply going to lose this. Okay, there's a move here, rookie four, which is very interesting if you take promotion, but check in here. White had to go that way. Instead, white blundered a series of checks. And after this, it's over because the pawn's just queening. And black wins. And Romania is now tied for second also after a massive upset on board four. That's wild. That's just, that, that, I mean, that's simply crazy, right? Okay, let's keep moving along. Uh, the next game I have for you is the matchup between Poland and Serbia. Every other matchup was a draw. This deciding game changed everything. It was a symmetrical structure Petrov, but White had an early space advantage, right? White's got more space in the center, more space on the queen side. But uh, Robert Marcus uh, was not to be deterred. He created counterplay with a4 and rook to... What? Rook a5? All right, go back and take on d5. Kasper Piorun sacrifices the bishop on g7, wins back material. Black has a bishop pair, but a totally bogus pawn structure. White has no bishop pair, but potentially some targets to attack like the king and the pawns. But now, Marcus just is like, well, I mean, if you're going to leave pawns around the board, I'm going to take them. Absolutely. I'm not worried about mate. My king is safe on f8. All right, king on f8, never mate. That's not the rhyme, but it doesn't matter. Now black is just up a pawn. Black's up a pawn with a better position. Bishop g6, what, you're not gonna mate me? What are you, nuts? Bishop e8. Look at this stubborn defense by black. Queen e7, no problem. And you know what's gonna happen at some point? The person trying to attack the other one is just going to overpress. They're going to make a slight inaccuracy, and immediately it happens. You see, black played queen h4 a couple of moves ago. So queen g5 a couple of moves ago. Last thing you thought was he's going to go back. You thought he was coming forward. But uh-oh, queen trade, and you're going to lose some more pawns. 
And that's exactly what happens. White overpresses. Black just locks down the position with this bishop on e8, anchoring the king's safety. Queen's gotta go, and you're just gonna lose material. There's too many things hanging. And Serbia beats Poland! What? That's amazing! Now, now Serbia's tied for third with 10, 10 points out of 12. There is a massive tie of teams with 10 points out of 12, and I'm going to try to show you as many games as I can. Netherlands and Georgia competing for that spot as well. This game, uh, a Benoni-esque Kings Indian style game by Jobava versus uh, Anish. This is something that has happened many, many times. Black has a good structure, but is worse. Uh, and as you can see, you know, black is getting the same kind of counterplay. Maybe b5, maybe f5, as we've seen a few times today. The superstar move of this game uh, came I uh, around move 20 when Anish Giri took on f7, okay, gave away his bishop, and in this position played an unbelievable move. You see, black played knight g7 to prevent anything from coming to e6. Which made it all the more shocking when Anish Giri put his rook right there. And the point is, black has nothing. Black has two plans here. Take the rook, attack with the pawns. If you take the rook, that allows something to get to d5, and then this to get to e7. Black is gasping for air. Gasping. That pawn is suffocating the position. There is nothing you can do. You try to counterattack rook e1, and Anish Giri glides forward, creates an umbrella pawn with the enemy, with, uh, with, with the pawn on h3, and simplifies. This is the thing about the top guys, they know when to simplify, and the next pawn is coming. Connected, protected past pawns, escorted by the most powerful knight in the history of chess, and Anish Giri makes it look effortless, getting the exact right endgame. If rook takes f4, it doesn't even matter, gf4. Black can't move. Black legitimately has no moves. King g8, knight f6. If you move the rook over here to try to get out, I just go f6. You come back, I play f5. Suffocating pressure here by Anish. A beautiful game. Rook e6, take a bow. All right? And the Netherlands win very convincingly against Georgia, and they are also tied with 10 points. Next game I have for you. We go to Kazakhstan versus Czech Republic. This was a back and forth match, decided again by one win. We have Aristan Bek Urazayev, who I've played probably a hundred times in Blitz, I think, versus, uh, whew, that's a tough one. I don't know how to pronounce Zbigniew. <laughs> I, I hope that's right. Hrachek I kind of can pronounce, but this one was a Rosalimo, a super imbalanced Rosalimo, where white went B4 early, obscure pawn structure started advancing on the queen side brought their queen out to f3 and started to immediately threaten nasty things against the black king we have a knight trade this is going to be a horseless game a5 b5 let's play c4 let's blow it up and get this white has a two on one on the queen side and long-term permanent pressure on that pawn on a6 but white also has a brewing potential attack on the king Rook e3, which way is white going to go? He's going the attack the king route. But f6, queen back to c1, bishop b5, rook c7. And now we get a position where the threats on the king were good, but white used that to get this protected outside pass pawn position. And even though white is a pawn down, he's better. Because this pawn's a problem for black. This is dominated and these pawns just don't move because the second they start moving, the king is weak. So Aristan Bek now protects the back rank, makes sure there's no back rank mate with h3, and plays rook a1, and starts advancing. A massive risk. Black has to be very accurate here to defend this position, otherwise that a pawn is gonna go. And Black was doing a good job, he was defending for a while, but this trade got white back into the game, and this was also a problem, because now that rook has certain things to deal with, queen d5 now is the only move. Queen f7. And I told you a long time ago, this pressure on the black position was probably going to pay off at some point. And on the 40th move, Hrachek makes a mistake. We have check here, rook c7, which is why back rank mate had to be protected. Because now the king gets out to h2, and you cannot protect against queen f7 and a7. If you play rook f8 in this position, queen g4, a7, a8, black can't stop the mate threat and the promotion. We have this and a shocking turn of events as Kazakhstan's bottom two boards, both IMs, defeat the Grandmasters 
on the uh, on the Czech team. And Kazakhstan is now also tied for third in a massive tie. And the final game of today's recap that I have for you is the game between Emilio Cordova and Ivan Saric. This was a crazy game. Peru, Croatia also battling for that third place spot. Also a back and forth match. Uh, Cordova plays a ready. We have um, a very, very, very wild game. So Saric takes a pawn. We've seen this before in this recap. Bobby Cheng, Yun Ludwig. He took on C4 and Cordova for that pawn started a wave of pawns. He played g4. I mean, look at this position. This is crazy. This is an insane position. Stockfish always hates these positions for white. It doesn't believe in them. It thinks that black has, like, totally good counterplay. But they're humans, right? And so they're not engines. And Cordova builds up this huge wall. d5, e4, f5, g4, h3. Black plays e5, trying to just take some space, not allow uh, white to take any more. But now after e5, apparently knight e1. And this blockade stopped the white attack. But long term, completely shut down his own pieces. Saric had to not play e5. He had to continue with gf5 in an almost counterintuitive way, allowing white to do this and trying to fight back. But by blocking White's attack, he slowed down his own pieces and now gives back a pawn to reactivate his own pieces. But oh my, oh my, Cordova is not about to let that go. Knight f5, rook f5, and suddenly the attack is broken through. The attack is broken through. And now it's all about picking up pawns. It's about picking up pawns and dealing with his opponent's counterplay. Ugly move, rook a2, but necessary. Knight a4, knight back to c3, rook back to f1. Sometimes to take five steps forward, you got to take one step back. Let's trade some queens. No? Okay, let's trade some queens. All right, I got the queens off. I'm going to defend my position now, and I'm going to reroute and uh, either get in on f5 or c4. And you see the king defending, you see the rook coming in, and uh, there's a lot of tactics here to calculate. But he calculates them perfectly, gets it into a winning endgame, and it takes a, it takes a while. 2680 rated players don't go away that quickly, but... Uh, at the end of the day, the pawns prevail. As we saw in the Giri game, the pawns prevail. And an amazing effort from Cordova. Cordova used to be 2650, 2660. Like, don't get it twisted. 2549, that's not his rating. That's his rating after moving to the States, finishing college here, you know, uh, not caring as much about chess as he did when he was younger. I played him when he was 2630, so he was 80 points higher rated than this. He gets a massive win for Peru, and Peru is also tied for third. It's Armenia at the top, USA second place, and then a 10-team tie for bronze right now in the Olympiad. Halfway point, tomorrow is a rest day. We'll probably have guessed the ELO because why not? Crazy to see Norway struggling. Are you impressed with 32 minutes of a recap and 12 games? I feel like these are so much fun. Are they fun? Let me know in the comments if you made it this far. Code Olympiad, courses are 33% off. I'll see you for round number seven after the rest day. Get out of here.